Hey, what's up, y'all? Matt here with Hatch in another episode of Built By. Hope you're doing awesome today. We talk a lot about marketing on this podcast, and we talk a lot about sales, and we talk a lot about you know building your business, but we've never really talked about, I guess, the journey that it takes to become a sales manager and become a successful sales manager in home improvement. So a few weeks ago, I had on Chuck Toki, who is you know well-respected sales manager in the industry. One of my favorite episodes that we've done. I encourage you to go back to listen to that if you haven't yet, but. He said something in the discussion that really interested me, which was your top performing sales reps don't always translate into successful sales managers. You know, we dove into it and we talked a lot about, you know, why is that? Why, why can't just that successful sales rep take what he or she is doing and apply that to a rest of a team? And what it is, is that is not a leadership quality. And there's certain things that make leaders set apart. So I really wanted to find somebody that has had that journey from successful sales rep to sales manager who's seen success and really ask them, like, what's your experience been like? And try to get a few things out of that person that can, you know, help maybe the next sales manager coming up and some of the things that they should be thinking about. I struck gold again, I feel like. Uh, I had the opportunity to connect with Colin Beck, who's the sales manager down in Texas for Express Flooring. And Express Flooring, they do a fantastic job of their sales and marketing processes. And a big piece of that is because of Colin's leadership and what he brings to that sales management role and how he coaches his reps and you know the whole nine yards. So there's a lot of stuff in this episode where I highly suggest maybe you listen to it Um, when you're thinking about hiring a new sales manager, maybe provide it to your sales reps. So if they have sales management in their future, is that what they want to be their next step? They can take a lot of things from Colin in this episode and I think apply it to their career and really, really become successful um, because I think he's got the right motivations. He's got the right drive and he's just got really good insights. So I'm going to go ahead and kick this episode off. Again, this is Colin Beck, who is the sales manager down at Express Flooring. I hope you enjoy. This is a podcast for home improvement and home services marketing. This is Built By. But you've got to be adaptable. You've got to find a way to accommodate an uncomfortable customer. If you're not getting the home advisor leads in the first five minutes, you shouldn't even do it. Hopefully we're eating their lunch while they're trying to get back up and running. I started out as a plumber, I uh, left, left college to uh, kind of take care of my wife and I and had a buddy who was working for a plumbing company and was making good money. And I said, you know what, I can work hard. That's what I do know I can do. So I went to uh, went became a plumber and I really fell in love with uh, the building process of a home, just all the, the technicalities of it. I'm kind of an engineered mind as a human being. Um, I like to break things down. So for me, plumbing was a lot of fun. and. I really wanted to figure out how to kind of take it to the next level, right? I didn't just want to be a plumber for the rest of my life. And mm-hmm. so I, I found an opportunity to go and actually start selling homes. Uh, I worked for David Weekly for a little while, and it was a, you know, kind of my first entry into a big sales role. Plumbing was nice because it gave me all the person skills and the people skills, but I, I really needed that technique, right? Um, so I, I went into the, the new home sales, didn't love it. <laughs> it wasn't, uh, <laughs> I, I quickly found out that there was a lot more design involved, not just technical stuff. And so then I got an opportunity to work for a remodeling company. And that's really where I kind of found my niche. I, I absolutely love the, the building side, the design side of it and being able to talk and, you know, explain each aspect of a bathroom. That's really, really where I was confident at the time. Yeah. Um, but then I also got introduced into this world of one call closing and, it was an art form in itself, and I just kind of went deep into it and indulged and, and have loved every aspect of it. And so I've kind of grown, and now I'm with a company called Express Flooring. We do in-home flooring, residential flooring, um, and it's a you know an amazing company. They're out of Arizona. They're expanding into Texas. I, I'm fortunate enough to be able to kind of build the branches here in Texas and get the company on its feet here. We're opening up in Denver here in a couple months and hopefully, you know, expand across the, the Southern Hemisphere of the United States. And so the, the sky's the limit right now, especially in the home improvement industry. Yeah, no, that's awesome, man. And I want to get all into, you know, what you're doing over Express Flooring and, and how you're coaching your reps. But really, I want to start from where you started, which I think is a fascinating story, you know, kind of your growth into that sales manager role and starting as a plumber. 
and being in the home and interacting with homeowners. And I can't think there's a better way to really kick off that sales career than actually being in there, you know, being in the weeds or being in the pipes. Um, what were some of the things that you learned in those early days that um, you think attributed to kind of your growth into a sales manager and how you interact with homeowners now? Sure. Um, that's a great question. Plumbing was a wild experience. Uh, <laughs> I mean, some of the stories I have and some of the things that I came across were, were truly life altering, you know, truly life altering. Mm -hmm. One of the things about being in the service industry is you see all walks of life you experience everything and you see how people live and you see how other people live. And, you know, it's kind of up to you to determine where you want to fall and, and being so young and being fortunate enough to be 18, 19 years old doing this and, mm -hmm. and, and going out and seeing all these opportunities and talking to all these different people, it really kind of opened my eyes up to, to what possibilities were. Mm -hmm. And the, I think the biggest thing that I took away from it all was was work ethic the the harder you work the further you will go and it doesn't matter what career path you're in you can't out talent hard work you just you just can't do it and and so i'm a firm believer that whatever you do you, if you you work as hard as you can give it i don't believe in the 110 120 150 percent give it 100 percent every single day if you, <laughs> gave, if you think you gave it 120 you probably only gave it 80. if you truly right. gave it 100 you give it 100 percent and and i think if you do that every single day it failure is just not an option at that point right mm -hmm. and that that's really what i learned from i mean being on my knees in you know plumbing and sewage and just the, the worst of the worst realizing that's where i didn't want to be that's where i didn't want to wind up and in my whole life there so how mm -hmm. do i get out of that and and i had talked to so many people and the number one thing was calling you just have to work hard mm. that's fascinating man and like a lot of people say they have horror stories from their first job. And I imagine the horror stories from like plumbing is oh, like I right was, up there. <laughs> I, I was, I was eight foot down in a person's backyard in, in South Dallas, cutting a pipe at 18 years old with a sawzall. And the gentleman that I'm there with the other plumber I'm there with, he, he had been with the company for years and years and years. He goes, Hey, you might want to wrap a shirt around your head before you start doing that. And, you know, I'm young and naive. I'm like, no, I'm okay. I've got this. And I start to cut it and a bunch of, you know, it kind of powders out. I was like, oh, oh man. Yeah. So I wrapped my shirt around. He goes, well, that was asbestos pipe. So you might want to put a, put a <laughs> shirt around your mouth. And, uh, you know, just un, un crazy stuff that, you know, that's it. I really, really developed a respect for people in the service industry. And I yeah. think that's where, you know, getting into sales and growing a team, I really wanted to give people an opportunity to do what they love. And I love helping people. I love serving people. And, you know, I just am fortunate enough that I get to do it in a position that allows me to do what I also love to do. Yeah. And that's what I'm interested in. Like w during those early days, like was sales management, even on your radar, like were you still just trying to figure things out? <laughs> you know, um, I don't know what was on my radar. I think I wanted to, <laughs> you know, there was a time where I wanted to own a plumbing company. In fact, my, one of my really good friends, Terry Don, he has opened up a plumbing company in Fort Worth back from where we were from. And he was the one that got me into Roto-Rooter to begin with. He and oh, I, wow. our first goal was to open a plumbing company together. I think, I think over the years, um, I, I, I started watching things on YouTube. I started seeing guys like Tony Robbins, Rick Grosso. <clears throat> um, there's a couple other ones, Dave Yoho, him and all of his sons. And I just started watching these, these YouTube videos and these podcasts. And I really fell in love with the idea of mastering the art of selling. You know, not necessarily being the best salesperson in the room or producing the highest numbers, but truly mastering the art of selling in the sense that, you know, I, I understand the art form entirely. Yeah. Yeah. That's awesome, man. And, you know, it's interesting. You're, you're mentioning like, you know, Rick Grosso, we actually had Grosso like university on a, a webinar that we had earlier this week and, and Dave Yoho's also partners with us. And we're very familiar with his methodology and it all kind of centers around this one called close. And you do. You, why did that resonate with you? I guess. Why? Why did that like you know make such an impact for you? Um, it's immediate gratification. Mm -hmm. You know, at the end of the day, it it that's really what it what it was for me. I, I I don't have a ton of patience when it comes to waiting on things. Right. I I don't like the I have to think about it or I'll get back to you. Um, I I learned at an early age that I impulse bought. <laughs> right and and most people do most things that people buy are bought on an impulse it, you know it's the it's the same concept of going to the grocery store with a grocery list or just going to the grocery store 
my wife and I bill when we go without the list is twice as high as it is when we go with the list every single time. Right. Yeah. And that same concept carries over into consumers and how they buy. And I think for me, I like being in the realm of a 5,000, <clears throat> a 5,000 to a $15,000 average ticket. And mm -hmm. I think that that, you know, to me, that's just such a, such a perfect little range to get people to make those, you know, educated impulse decisions that we're looking for that really move this industry along. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, it's pretty cool because I think all sales reps have kind of a unique style. Um, of course there's a, you know, script to follow. And a lot of people say you should follow the script exactly. But what I've found is like some of the best reps, you know, take little pieces from here and there. Like you mentioned, you know, watching YouTube videos and, and all of these things. So, um, you know, you mentioned, uh, Rick Grosso and Dave Yo, but what, what were some of the biggest influences on you as you kind of grew into that sales rep role and really accelerated your, your skills? Yeah. So I, yeah, I had a granddad who was an oil and gas, an old land man, uh, here in mm -hmm. Texas and kind of hopped in on the Barnett shell. And, you know, I got to, I, I, I got to see this guy, you know, I, I said this guy, I got to see this man. I mean, my, my granddad, I got to see him talk in a ways that were truly magnificent. I, mm -hmm. I, I, there's not really a word to describe the way you can watch somebody persuade in, in such an elegant manner. And sometimes it wasn't so elegant, <laughs> you know, it was, it was always fun though. And, and I think growing up for me, my dad was uh, more on the operation side, but he started out as a courier and, and was in sales at a young, young age. And I, I think it's an opportunity for, for individuals to, to be successful and work their way through a skill and learn a skill and master a skill without actually having to go through the burdens of you know, going to college if it's not for them or going to, you know, going down the route of corporate America, right? For, mm -hmm. for me, it was a way to kind of escape that idea that I have to go and I have to work for someone else. And at the end of the day, you're a full commission salesperson when I started, right? It, it, I own my own company is the way I thought about it. I just yeah. had a company that facilitated everything for me. Um, and, and thinking about it that way really gave me this sense of, sense of encouragement as I went through my day that everything I was doing was for me and the betterment of me. And I was, I was working towards my goals and, and it paid off. And I think at the end of the day, you know, being in sales, that's one of the biggest things as salespeople, we love the income and mm -hmm. we, but we, but we don't want to facilitate the income. We want somebody to give us leads that are wonderful. We want you to give us everything and we just want to go talk. Right. Yeah. I think for me, it was kind of taking that and expanding on that idea that maybe I, you know, maybe I want to facilitate all of it. I do want to truly understand the art of selling and everything that's involved. Yeah. Yeah. And it's so interesting. You mentioned that, you know, the art of selling too. And on the flip side of the conversation we had the other, other day was, uh, you know, the, basically it was about, is the one call closed, um, dying or thriving. And the general consensus was that it's still very much alive and well, but there's a lot of things that happen. Let's say you don't close on the first call and it yep. comes down to like the follow-up piece of that. So when you were a sales rep and kind of transitioning to the sales manager role, um, how much of that like follow-up did you uh, put in place? I, I'd love to hear kind of your approach to that. Let's say you didn't close on the first call. What, what, what were you doing? Yeah. So it's, it's funny at my first sales job, um, in, in Austin, when I got here, I had a manager influence my entire career. His name is Mike Saunders. And I, and I absolutely owe everything that I I've become, you know, mm -hmm. partially to the, to this man, him and John Keenan were both such huge influences on me that I, I was very fortunate that I got to work with such smart individuals who had done this for a while. One of the things that he kind of taught me was in, and he had this old saying for it, there's no pity in be back city. You, there's mm. there's no such thing. You, we don't do follow ups, right? Um, now, I was at a company that was a lead generation machine. We were spoiled. We we showed up every day to leads, right? So the goal was go out and close as hard as you can and close as many as you can on that one call close, and don't worry about the back end. There's people doing rehash appointments. There's people doing the follow ups and the stuff things to become of them. It'll become right. Mm -hmm. I've kind of carried that same that same mentality into what I do now, I'm a little bit more understanding on the follow-up side, right? Especially doing whole home flooring. And this is where it gets tricky for us because we have people that are not even moved into the home. They're, they haven't even closed on the home yet. And they're just trying to get an understanding of price, right? Mm -hmm. Those I understand insurance bids, for example, we're in Houston right now with the ice storm. Yeah. Our insurance business was out the roof. All of those are a follow-up though. 
right? There's still potential to earn and there's still potential to make. However, you have to do the work and you have to follow up. So I've become a little bit more lenient and a little bit more understanding on that side, but I am a true firm believer that the best time for these and these customers to buy is now. It, it, it's now and it always will be now. Yeah. That's awesome. And that's a pretty cool mentality to have. And I'm sure it shows, you know, in your reps. And I want to dive in a little bit to, you know, what you were saying about, you know, your, your mentality as a sales manager, like what the reason that you became one kind of those um, internal values, I guess you have, which is like, it's not about money. It's, it's about seeing your team succeed. And that's really what kind of attracted you to this role. And I was having a conversation with um, Chuck Toki, he's another sales manager in the home improvement industry. And he was saying that, you know, a lot of reps that transition to sales manager don't become successful. And it's exactly because they don't have that mentality. They just try to kind of apply, you know, what they've done. And they think that secret sauce is going to work for everyone rather than, you know, trying to, I don't know, provide a net for everybody yeah. on their team. Um, I'd love to hear a little bit, you know, outside of the realization that you had, which was, you know, as it's the next step in my career, um, what was that? Like, when did you kind of form that line of thinking? And, and I guess, how did you kind of come to that and realize that sales management was going to be kind of a, a successful position for you? I, I actually really agree with the the statement that, and, and what was his name? I'm, I apologize. The, the other gentleman. Yeah. Uh, Chuck Toki. Yeah, I, I really agree with his position on that. Um, I, I actually, I firmly believe that I was a sales manager that got the opportunity to be a design <laughs> consultant to get into the role of a sales manager. Um, right. From a very, very young age, I, I've been, you know, what, what my parents, what my teachers, what my coaches considered a leader. And I, I kind of followed in those footsteps. You know, I didn't really have a... Um, I, I don't want to say I didn't care. That's not the right word. I think it's more so I, I kind of just understood that not everybody would like me being the me that I was all the way through my childhood. And I moved around my parents. We, we lived in Fort Worth, Austin, Georgia, Austin, Fort Worth, Austin, Fort Worth. And mm -hmm. so my, my, we've constantly moved around. I didn't get an opportunity to really build up a, a friend base. And, and through that, I just kind of developed who I was and how I was going to be. And for me, that was, you know, I really wanted to be able to control and manipulate every situation, mm -hmm. um, call it a control freak whatever it may be, but I did it in a way that I would, I, I, I enjoyed being the one facilitating it and doing it. And to me, yeah. that's the, the premise of a leader, right? Everybody can be a boss. Anybody can be a boss. I, I don't want to be a boss. I don't want to sit behind a desk and delegate. I don't want to make phone calls and say, Oh, you're doing really bad today. You know, I, I want to be able to make phone calls and send text messages, cheering people up, but then give feedback out in the field with them because I'm doing ride alongs because I've done this because I was a part of this and, and I was fortunate enough to be able to be a design consultant. And I think, you know, to, to Chuck's point, not every design consultant or salesperson can be a good sales manager, mm -hmm. but I think it takes a good sale. A good sales manager has to be a design consultant or a salesperson at some point in time. Yeah. To, yeah, to have lived that life and kind of understand, you know, what your reps are going through on a day to day basis, right? I mean, the driving, I was putting 40,000 miles on my pickup truck a year, right? I mean, that alone, just understanding how much driving these reps do to me is so vital because I can change a person's day. I can change the outcome of their day simply by keeping them in a general area and not having them make our drives back and forth to appointments. That, yeah. That's a mindset thing that I can actually physically manipulate in these guys. And that's a tool that I can use to raise closing percentages. Right. And, and I think those are things that kind of go misinterpreted. I think those are things that we kind of, you know, throw into this mix of, well, that's what these guys do. That's their job. Mm -hmm. it, it is their job, but why don't we help them? You know, why don't we, I, I always tell my salespeople, I, I always say my job's not to turn them into salespeople. I hire mm -hmm. salespeople. My job's to take whatever they're really good at, whatever their, their strong, their strong suit is, my job is to take that and amplify that tenfold to make them that much better, right? To facilitate every opportunity that I can mm -hmm. for them to excel. And, and that's in all aspects. And I think it takes a salesperson to really understand how that works. Yeah, that's awesome. So, you know, transitioning to that sales manager role from where you were as a sales rep, you know, what were some of the most impactful things you think that you had to learn um, it's, it's never an easy transition. I feel like when you, when you go take over a team, but, um, it's, it sounds like you had a lot of success. So I'd love to hear kind of the, the early days of what you did to kind of, um, bridge the gap. 
early days were tough. I, I was a young guy trying to manage, you know, pe some people twice my age. Um, and, and I didn't go about it the right way, the right, the first time. Um, it was mm -hmm. definitely a learning process. I definitely tried to come out as a, a young gun and a, you know, a hard hand and kind of lay down the law and that it, it worked with some people, but it didn't work with everybody. For me, that's the type of management I like. I want somebody to call me out. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, but I quickly learned it wasn't what I wanted it was what worked for the team. And, and so one of the, I think the most important thing that I learned was adapting, right? You know, we teach design consultants and sales reps when they go into homes, we teach them that it's three, two, one showtime, whatever's on the other side of that door you adapt to from a management side. I think we forget to adapt to our salespeople. Um, and mm -hmm. that's something that I really put a focus on and a big emphasis on is making sure that I take the phone calls and I really understand where these guys are coming from and, and really understand how I can help them. Yeah. That's awesome, man. And you know, you mentioned that you like to hire sales reps and kind of accentuate their strengths in the field or whatever. And what I'm seeing now is like, there's kind of a split between, you know, you, you think of sales reps, you think of those like super charismatic folks that, you know, can, can charm their way into any house. They have a set playbook and a style, and this is my way and I'm going to do it. While other companies are starting to look at kind of those those learners or the people that yeah. are willing to kind of follow a new process. What, what kind of, do you sit on either side of that fence or you're right in the middle? I'd love to hear your mentality there. I'm so glad you followed up with this question. Um, I actually, am, I go both ways. I, I mm -hmm. started, I was, I, I started in the industry hoping somebody when I was 21 would pick me up and say, Hey, I'll teach you what you need to know. Right. Yeah. I, I do believe salespeople are born. I don't believe salespeople are made. And, and what I mean by that is I think the way that you're raised, the way that you're born, the family that you're brought up into, that determines your charisma. That, inter that determines your ability to be able to speak in front of somebody or, or, mm -hmm. or, or draw the attention of the room. That is just something that, that, that's inherent to you. I can't give you that. Mm -hmm. So when I say I hire salespeople, I hire people that have that attribute, that have the ability to draw you in. Yeah, you know, my favorite thing is in an interview, when I can spend about three minutes talking about the job and then the next 40 minutes are talking about everything about that person and what makes that person click and what drives them, what motivates them. When you get past the point of logic and you get into the emotional side of things, it's a lot more fun. It's a lot more interesting, right? Mm -hmm. Every, every logical decision is based on emotion, right? It, we go through that when we're buying a car, there's that part of us that goes, Oh my gosh, that thing is awesome looking, right? I can't afford that monthly payment, but it looks really good. <laughs> and a lot of times that emotion will overdraw that logic. And mm -hmm. so, so for me, it's really figuring out how that emotion plays into every situation, every design consultant, every salesperson. And that's the part that I look for when hiring somebody. So for me, it's not so much are they green and have they had all the training in the world or is this their first sales job? For me, it's how do they present themselves and how do they draw the room to them? Yeah. Yeah. It's, it kind of reminds me of like, I think like the new England Patriots and like Bill Belichick. And like when I first started my job here at hatch, like our CEO told me, he was like, you can have all the talent in the world, but unless you execute, it's, it's meaningless. So when you get your reps out in the field and, and do you do ride alongs, do you kind of coach them in the process? Are you, you know, watching their messaging? I, I'd love to hear kind of your, your in-depth, you know, let's say you get a new rep. What, what is the process like? Yeah. So with new reps, it's great. We have a, we have a two week onboarding process and I think most companies are pretty similar, right? There's this two week in classroom learning. Um, when we get reps out in the field and they're on their own, my goal is within a day or two of them being on their own to get eyes mm -hmm. on them, whether it's me or it's my national sales trainer, get somebody riding along with them to, to touch them right then and there to make sure that they're following the process right out the door. I'm not a, I, I, I know this is going to sound a little, you know, hypocritical. I don't believe in a script, but I believe in a script, right? I, I don't believe that we should go out and I should have all these people say the exact 4,000 words in the exact way at the exact timing. Mm -hmm. However, there's a reason and there's a why behind everything we say. And I want these people to understand why we do what we do. So for me, it's imperative that they get out on ride alongs. They get out with people that are successful and understand that why to help mm -hmm. them understand that. But then it's important for me or important for my national sales trainer to watch them pitch, to make sure they are, you know, like you said, it doesn't matter how much talent you have. If you can't produce, you can't produce. Right. Mm -hmm. So it's up to us to figure out, you know, if they're going to produce and if they are going to produce, what do I need to do to get them there now? 
because the glory of the one call close home business is everything changes today. You have a bad closing percentage yesterday that can change today. Yeah, man, that's, that's so awesome. It's just cool to hear kind of your insights and all this and, and how you're coaching your reps and how you're hiring. And I think it's really fascinating and it, the results I think speak for themselves. You guys are, are crushing it. Um, you know, I want to dive in a little bit into like some of the sales methodologies and we've kind of touched on it, you know, a few times talking about the one call close and, and things like that, but just getting a general sense for how things stand in the industry. Right. Um, you know, the industry, and I've said this to a few people, but you know, if you're in home improvement right now, you're, you're making money. It's, it's pretty, things are looking good. You know, lead flow looks good. Um, you know, you mentioned you transitioned from a company that was like driving a ton of leads and really handling the follow-up and everything to a position where, um, you might not be getting as many leads. And it sounds like more of the emphasis is on sales to go out and, and really hunt and, and knock, knock out, knock down doors. So, you know, the way that everything looks right now, do you foresee any impacts in the, in the coming months? Um, do you, do you think things are going to keep kind of riding the same wave that we're seeing? I'd, I'd love to hear kind of your, yeah. your take there. So, so I, I, I might have mis I might have misled you a little bit. We, so we are actually, I, I did. Statewide was great. Statewide was a lead generation machine, but so are we at Express, and that's one of the gotcha. biggest benefits that we provide to these salespeople that do come on board. We mm -hmm. offer a hundred percent vetted, absolute warm leads. We have a CS, uh, we have a um, customer service department. That is absolutely phenomenal. And they get on the phone and they set these customers up for the idea that there is going to be a price presented for today and that that price is going to be good for today only. And we offer some amazing first incentive appointment or first mm -hmm. appointment incentives. So I didn't, I didn't mean to mislead you, but we, we are, a, we are very fortunate in our, our lead count and the way we, we, we have an incredible marketing department. In fact, I'm spending a week next week with our head of marketing in Houston to really look at how we can tighten up the budget there, what we can do. Um, in Austin and San Antonio leads through this past month have been a little on the slower side, but we're getting back into school. And I'll tell you in Texas, summertime is the worst time for leads, mm -hmm. right? Um, as far as the continuation of this, that's a, gr that's a very tough question. I, you know, I, I'm very optimistic and I hope that going into the future, we do continue to have a, a substantial rise in leads and people building homes and people buying homes. Um, you know, unfortunately, I think with as good as the market is right now, there's probably going to be a time where it either flattens out or, you know, maybe goes through a little decline. And I think we, you know, I think everybody in the home improvement industry understands that and kind mm -hmm. of understands there's probably going to be a little bit of decline on the, the, the home buying side, but that, that always looks out great for the home remodeling side. Right now we're seeing something here in Austin. People can't afford to buy a new home in Austin. So they're going through and they're we're fixing their home. That's where a lot of our you know, lead came from over 2020 and early 2021 because of the pandemic, we were able to get, I mean, all these people at home, right? Mm -hmm. Well, we'll go through another time where homes aren't going to be selling and the market's not going to be hot. And now people are still at home and they're still wanting to change things. And now they realize, you know, the market's kind of died and they're stuck with a home that, you know, that they have to put value into. Uh, I, I think one thing that always is true is history always repeats itself, right? <laughs> yep. And, um, you know, I think we'll quickly get back to the point to where people are spending 15, 20 and 30 years in homes instead of flipping them every five. Yeah, man, it's it's cool. You know, you mentioned that customer service team too, right? That's like, yep. I, I want to go back. I want to re revisit that because I think that's pretty cool. I would like to zoom in there a little bit about like, so Lee comes in, your customer service team really uh, gets on the phone with the lead um, and is very upfront about the pricing that's coming in today, right? Or coming in the day of the appointment. Not upfront about the pricing, the the way that they, they we have a, a wonderful, a wonderful script, but the way that they talk, we have some amazing incentives and they want to make sure that both homeowners are there to receive these amazing incentives because most of these incentives are only available on the initial visit. Mm -hmm. um, and what we find is the leads are extremely, extremely qualified. I mean, we close at a 62% on average, uh, which is wow. extremely high for the in-home, in-home sales industry. Yeah. Um, and, you know, it, I, I, <laughs> I think it's a really, really good way of qualifying leads up front because it does weed out a lot of, we don't have, we don't use, you know, for most part, we don't use stuff like Angie's List or Home Advisor. We, we put commercials, we do newspapers, we do mm. radio stations. That's how people get in touch with us. And so we truly get the people calling us for the service and we're not reaching out to them. They're calling in, they're understanding this appointment, they're understanding that both people need to be home. And what we find is that we really run about a, you know, anywhere from a 90 to a 95% qualified lead rate. 
Dang. Wow. So that's all being qualified by that, that customer service team before it even touches you guys. Absolutely. Very cool. That's, that's fantastic. And you know, that 95% qualified lead, that's why your, you know, close rates so high. It's crazy. Like we were, th they were throwing stats out yesterday. Like typically the one call close is like lower than 50%, but like 62%. That's, that's awesome, man. Um, you know, in terms of technology and tools that you guys might be using on the sales side, I'd love to hear some things that really have, you know, impacted your team and anything yeah. that um, you think businesses of of your size, your caliber should mm. definitely be looking at. iPads and laser measures. <laughs> <laughs> okay. the, 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 the getting away from a tape measure was probably the best thing for the flooring industry because it takes a four hour measuring appointment down to an hour long, right? Mm. Um, I mean, even in your biggest three, 4,000 square foot homes, you can measure a whole home in about an hour with a laser and it would take you, I mean, take you all night with the tape measure and a notebook, right? What's, yeah. uh, we, what we have this great app it's called Measure Squared. We, we can measure everything in a room. You just go wall to wall and it plugs it into this app. It'll draw out a floor plan for you. We use that same floor plan. They go on to our installers and our installers can see exactly, you know, where the seams are, where the cuts are where the doors, the hallways, the quarter round, everything goes. It really makes for a nice process. Um, getting into technology, every, you know, a lot of organizations are kind of scared or, or, you know, wary of doing it because it's a big change. It's a big change. It's well, well worth the change. I, I have now been involved in it two times. Statewide, I was kind of the uh, liaison for my team in Austin to get onto the to get onto the electronic deal, the iPad. I found the apps. I found the software. I, I, I kind of built that program for statewide. And when I came to express, they already kind of had it set up. I just had already known how to do a lot of this. So for me, teaching it was the easy part. And I think that's the hardest part for a lot of us. You know, we have some of these guys out here that are 60, 65 years old, still selling in home. You know, mm -hmm. they don't even own an iPad. So just getting them into an AT&T store to buy the iPad, the, you know, that's <laughs> a task in itself. Teaching them how to utilize it, it it's funny. I, I tend to have a lot more luck with them than, you know, than somebody that just flat out chooses not to use it. That they, They're willing to learn. And I think as design consultant salespeople, that's important to constantly be, um, can't, can't think of the word, but, you know, constantly just be learning and, and adapting yeah. to the world around you. And I think that's how companies should be too. Yeah, that's awesome, man. And, you know, I was talking to uh, Pella Windows and Doors out in Arizona, you know, a while back. And what they found is that they've actually hired like former successful sales reps, like part time to kind of help facilitate some of this technology and these tools and, and kind of run it on their behalf while their sales reps are running stuff. So there's a lot of ways to, to, to approach the issue. But at the end of the day, like I can't imagine growing a company without like technology and tools in place. Sure. Yeah, yeah. I, 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 I'm, I'm a hundred percent there with you. I, I think it's just, uh, I mean, we still have a deal where we, we still use paper contracts every now and then, because with some people, you just have to getting a physical box of paper contracts from a printer delivered to your store <laughs> poses a big problem. A lot of the time, yeah. <laughs> especially now with, with having such few delivery drivers that it, it almost has become imperative that we do switch to paperless because yeah. of availability. Yeah. Yeah, uh, that's that's awesome, man. Um, yeah, this has been a great conversation. I've got one last question I'd like to ask every guest, which is super vague on purpose, but what's the number one piece of advice you would give to anybody in home improvement right now? Work hard, and yeah, I mean, truly, just just work hard. Outwork everybody around you. If you if you see somebody and they're working harder than you, figure out what you have to do to 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 excel and get past that point. But don't give up. I think you know. I think they go hand in hand, right? Just mm -hmm. keep pushing. Don't give up. Continue doing what you're doing and, and it will pan out for you. You just have to put your mind to it and you have to work hard. Sales is so hard. I mean, I have had months where I have had some of the biggest paychecks of my life to turn around to the next month to have a hundred dollars come by on that, on a paycheck. <laughs> right. And, and it's, it's, it, it can be, it can be extremely painful at times, but it is in my opinion, one of the most rewarding careers that you can have out there. Yeah. That's awesome, man. L love it. So that was all the questions I had. This has been a fantastic episode. I, I really appreciate you coming on, you know, um, for any listeners that maybe want to connect with you, learn more about you, or if you have anything you want to plug, feel free to, uh, yeah. Is there anywhere they should go specifically or, um, anything along those lines? Yeah. So I, I don't do a lot of social media. My wife actually <laughs> told me, she goes, you need to make an Instagram just for this podcast. I said, no, 
We're not going to. <laughs> LinkedIn is the best way to get in touch with me. You can go on LinkedIn. My name's Colin Beck. It's a picture of you know me wearing a suit. Um, I, I connect. That's how Matt and I connected, and, and it's mm -hmm. probably the easiest way to get in touch with me. Um, obviously, if you're in the state of Texas or the state of Arizona, you need flooring. Call Express Flooring. Great company. We we offer a lifetime installation warranty, which you know I'm as far as I know we're the only company that does so. We will offer we will install for a lifetime under warranty for for customers. It's a very big deal. Um, so give us a call. Yeah. Awesome, man. You know, you mentioned your dog in the background earlier Yeah. for the listeners that are watching or for the viewers that are watching, it probably has looked like a cow blanket on the background, but it's it <laughs> the is. most it, well-behaved dog actual, ever. I, my couch is usually nice and made, but when you have a 145 pound dog, she tends to, <laughs> tends to change it the way she wants it. Right. <laughs> yeah, That's she, I, I, you know, I love great names. They're, they're one of my favorite breeds. I always tell people, you know, if you're looking for your first dog, the Great Dane is the best one out there. They do nothing for 22 hours out of the day. This <laughs> is her. Awesome. This is her right here. She she's my youngest dog. She's never gone in a crate. She's yeah. been completely house trained since we got her. I mean, just absolutely phenomenal. It, it's funny. I have a ball python sitting next to me, and she loves to lay in here with my ball python. And she'll every once in a while she'll peek her head up and, and take a look. But <laughs> too much awesome, fun. Man. Yeah. Very cool. Very cool. Again, Colin, thanks so much for coming on, man. This has been a great episode and uh, definitely until next time. Absolutely. Thank you so much for having me, Matt. It was a pleasure.